is good. All right, let's carry on with Second Peter this afternoon. Second Peter is where we're going to be. We'll continue in chapter two. It's good to do these things, um, going through these books, because there's so many verses that we quote, so many verses that people use and uh, things. But a lot of times we don't see them in the context in which they were written. And so it gives us a lot more um, uh, emphasis, a lot more backing when we see these things written in context. It's a lot easier for us to remember where they are and uh, realize that. So a lot of times we come across, when you're reading through or studying through a particular book, you come across a, a, a certain verse that you, know, you quote all the time and you use it. And then sometimes when you read it in context, you're like, that's not actually what that's talking about. <laughs> you're thinking, oh, you have to rethink what, uh, what you've been quoting that verse for the whole time. Now, I was trying to find a place as I was studying this. I was trying to find a place to, uh, to break this up because uh, I thought it's quite a long chapter and there's quite a lot in it. But it's, it's, to me, it's, this, it's the topic of the second chapter is all together. And so we'll just we'll keep going and we'll find wherever the Lord um, the Lord leads us to do. Excuse me, I took my towel off there. Um, wherever the Lord leads us to to quit for today or, or to maybe go through the whole thing, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But um, I could not find a place to break it up. Whereas in the other chapters, we've been able to find clear instances where he's either switched gears or he's added something in. But I just really can't find anywhere in this. So. We'll just keep going uh, for this just now. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we come to you today. We ask for your blessings, we ask for your protection. And Lord, we ask for your anointing and your power upon us this afternoon. I pray the Holy Spirit would guide us and we'd have spirit-filled teaching and spirit-filled listening. Lord, that um, all things would be done, that we'd all be uh, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit today. Lord, as, as the words are said through me, I pray that we'd all listen and learn and uh, be strengthened by these messages today, what you have for us. We thank you for this morning's service. Thank you for all that are here and all that will be watching and all that will watch. Lord, we do pray for each one of these. I pray that you would guide us in all things that we do. Help us, Lord, especially this time, uh, to get out and, and be seeing souls saved and, and seeing the gospel go forth. And we build this place up and, and be a buzzing church for you. Lord, we are buzzing and we know that and, and people... We know that we're doing the right things, but Lord, we, we want to see more people here physically uh, in this church as well and expand our family here in this time. Lord, be with us and bless us and help us in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, so he starts off in chapter 2, 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, how many times in school did your teacher tell you you weren't allowed to start a sentence with and, but, or because? Obviously, they never read the Bible. You know, because <laughs> here we have, but... But, well, of course, you know, the, the argument is that uh, the, the, the Hebrew, the Greek and the things didn't really have um, uh, divisions like chapters. So, but still, it's starting a sentence with it. Uh, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who, sh who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought, bought them and bring, swift uh, bring upon themselves swift destruction destructions and many shall follow their pernicious ways uh, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of so first of all he's giving a warning to these false prophets you know we've talked about love we've seen how john and james had love had repentance had righteous walking and uh, here he's giving us um you know a, a, another warning just like john did about the antichrist that you know that many these uh, that even is now in the world the spirit of antichrist is now in the world and we're to try the spirits to see where they've gone and again this with peter but there there were false prophets also among the people he said this is not a new thing when we go back into the scriptures into the old testament we see there were false prophets god even gave the test of a prophet to say if one thing did not come true that he said he was to be a, marked as a false prophet and you were not to be afraid of him you're not basically not to listen to what he said because if just one thing was false it was not of god a prophet of god has to have a hundred percent record correctness otherwise he's not speaking from god because a prophet of god is going to, is going to be is speaking the words that god has said and god when god speaks the words through his prophet he's going to those things are going to come to pass so if something that a prophet says does not come to pass he was not speaking of god and therefore we have to say well wait a minute what was wrong with that 
You know, so there was a, a strict, strict thing. People say, oh, this guy's great. He's got 90% right. It's not good enough. This guy's 95% right. And it's not good enough. This guy's 99.9% .9 right. It's not good enough. God demanded 100% perfection from his prophets. Amen. You know, and still today we see that God is still giving us the scriptures and still says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished all good works. He's given us the scriptures. And God expects that from his prophets of today, his preachers. That's what I'm talking about. His preachers, those that are spreading the word. God wants them to be perfect in their doctrine, what they're saying. Because he wants to do that. Does that mean that every preacher is going to be perfect? No, not necessarily. But it should be our goal that if we discover that something is wrong in what we've said or what we do, to, to change that. To say, well... What I said was wrong then, you know. And uh, we, there was a video uh, somebody shared the other day. It was talking about the difference between uh, the anointing and the gift. And um, it was really because people can get up and they can speak. And they can speak. And you've seen even in the lost world, you've got great orators. They can get up and they can waffle and they can give you a speech. And you would think they had studied for hours to write out the speech. But it's a gift that they have to be able to speak. And so a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers are doing that. They're speaking on their gift of the gab, if you like. Have you ever heard the gift of the gab? They're speaking on that basis alone. And there's a, wow, that must be of God. But they don't have the anointing of the Spirit on top of it. So beware of what someone is doing. That they have, yes, they have the gift of it, but they have the anointing. You know, because it's when the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon the preacher that the, the gospel can flow, that the things can flow, and that we can know what we're hearing, and because we can then go to the scriptures and study it and say, hey, you know, that's exactly true. Amen. So we've got to be careful of these things. There's false prophets who will do that. They will use the gift of the gab. They will convince you. They will even, as it says in verse 2, speak evil of those of the way of the, that follow the way of truth. They will speak you. The minute you start to start doing for God and working for God and doing the way of truth, people are going to start speaking evil of you. Amen. And he says, just, just as a word that before, there's going to be, again, there's going to be false teachers among you who privily, notice this, privily, not publicly, but privily, shall bring in damnable heresies, even deny the Lord that bought them. We have that today. We have these heretical things that have come in just you know somebody just come into the church and wave a big sign and say this is what I'm going to be teaching because people go like whoa, whoa wait a minute now a friend of mine just shared a video on Facebook a little while ago and it was it was talking about the, the, the swearing in Hollywood starting in 1939 with one swear word you know in Gone with the Wind or whatever it was you know everybody quotes that and that's the first swear word ever in Hollywood and it shows the graph of how it just goes up. And in the last 10 years, it just went like that. And so what they did is they did a test and they took a, a paintball and they fired one paintball at this family. The family sat in front of the television, fired one paintball. You know, big, you know, big deal, one swear word. Everybody says, big one deal. You know. And then they took one of the movies. It was um, some new mo uh, movie from a couple of years ago. And there was like thousands of swear words in it. You know, blasphemies, F words sex and nudity drunkenness and all these kind of things and there was over 2,000 things so they took that they, they shot then 2,000 paintballs or something like that at this family and you see I mean the flowers are getting smashed and, this, and the family's just getting riddled with paintballs and it gives the, the, the impact that one swear word's not a big deal but then you fire that whole movie just just one after the other boom, 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 like that. and it was it was crazy you just, it give, really gives you the impact of what has happened in this day and age. These things are brought in sneakily and then it just escalates to where now you just, it's normal. You know, when we took the cadets flying, we had to turn off two movies. Because the movies that they brought, I mean, they're teenagers and they brought two movies and it just started effing in this. And they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, it's just, that's ridiculous. And they didn't, they didn't see anything wrong with it. And so I went and found something that was kind of appropriate for that didn't have any swearing and half of them it was an old old British comedy thing and um, I thought well if we're going to watch something you know at least it'd be clean in that way so I put that on for them and a couple of them thought it was funny and them was just well, this is not funny so there's there's no smooching there's no swearing and the kids like 15 years old. 
But we see what happens when that just slithers in that way. And these false prophets bring in damnable heresies, privily, privately, just sneaking them in. And then once they're snuck in, it starts to expand, it starts to grow. And you don't even realize it was brought in in the first place. If it hadn't started with that one swear word, you know, that's where it starts. It starts with that one little thing. Even denying the Lord that bought them. How many things do you, take, you see today saying Jesus is not really God in the flesh. He's just the Son of God. Or, or another Jesus. Denying Jesus. And it says denying the Lord that bought them. That means that there, these people are saved. These people are blood-bought, born-again believers. To have been bought by Christ, they're obviously saved. Now they're denying him. Now they're turning away from him. Now they're denying his truth, denying his power, denying what he is doing. And what they're doing, they're bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow the pernicious ways. And sadly, we see that today. Many are following after these ones because somebody makes a name for himself. And somebody gets popular in one thing. Everybody's, ooh, this guy's great. This guy's great. And then he sneaks in a damnable heresy, you know. Uh, one that just recently comes to mind is, is Kent Holbein. I've shared his evolution teaching, not big on, on it, but he was really good on the evolution. He preached on the Illuminati. He preached on the New World Order. And he, he really was just, boom, right down the line. I mean, solid. You could, you could trust him to, do, to, say, to, to preach what, what was truth. And then they, they did him for fraud and stuff like that, and he ended up in prison. And he's been in prison for a long time. Was it nine years? Nine years he was in prison. But now that he's come out, he's now preaching things. He's, he's promoting a book called The Shack that Oprah Winfrey likes. But I'm sorry, if, you're, if, you, if, if you and Oprah Winfrey can promote the same book, there's something wrong there. You know, but the, the guy that he's got hooked up with, this guy named Steve Anderson, who is just full of hatred and just, just, just full of hate. And there's no love in his message. It's just... It's all hate. But sad to see these things, little things just get in there. And a lot of people that followed him are following along with what he's now teaching. But there are some that are studying for themselves and saying, you know what, there's a, a friend of ours has, has done a video and I'm saying, you know, I used to share this stuff all the time, but I've got to call him out. Yeah, I've got to call him out and show where he's wrong. And you could see when he was doing the video how upset he was that this had happened, that he's having to do this. But many will follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil speaking of, spoken of. And that's it. We find this anger, we find this hatred and the evil speaking of the ways of truth. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Why are they making merchandise of you? Like you would think this was written today. You would think that Peter went in and turned on the God channels and wrote his book about that. You would think. Think about it. Making merchandise of you. What is it? Well, send this to plant this seed. Send this money to me. Why? So that I can buy a new plane. You know? You got guys like um, Kenneth Copeland's got like nine private jets, his own runway. What possible need do you have for even two private jets? You know, maybe you have one for overseas and one for, for going around the, the, the coast. You know, Chris Huss was telling me about a preacher friend that they have that lives up in Maine. That he has an airplane and he flies to different places uh, to preach. You know, he flies his own plane. He, he does it himself. And, you know, he'll preach on Sunday, on Sunday morning. Then he'll fly to somewhere else and preach in the afternoon. And then he'll fly somewhere else and preach that night because he can get there very quickly. And he pays for that. That's fair enough. You know, if you've got the cap 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 capacity and the capabilities to do that, then fair enough. I don't grudge somebody flying around. But when you have multi-million dollar airplanes, think about how much money that could go. And you said, well, you need to send us this money because we need to feed the poor. So we'll sell one of your airplanes and feed the poor. We need housing. Well, actually, why don't you just take your airplane over? They go live in that. <laughs> you know, they're making merchandise of those that send in money. Now you got to be nuts to send money to somebody you don't know. Really, you have to be. When we think about what God has called us to do and the way he set it up through the local church, 
you know, send this money and you'll get this return. You see something on the shopping channel, and if they did that in the shopping town, said, "Hey, send us this money, and, and you'll get a you'll we'll, we'll 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 send you happy thoughts." You'd be like, "I know, don't be silly." But when it's in the package under a religious thing, you think, "Oh yes, I'm going to do that. Send that away." And people just keep sending money, and they get pressurized because they're not getting the blessing. So what do they say? Well, you're not sending enough. You've not got enough faith. So they send more money till they're eventually broke. Or the Jehovah's Witnesses in 1975, they said that Jesus was coming back. Had a lot of people sell their homes, quit their jobs, sell everything they had, give it to the church because Jesus was coming back. What happened? 1975 passed by, Jesus didn't come back. So you've got a a bunch of homeless, jobless, penniless Jehovah's Witnesses. And do you think the church helped them out? No. Hey, can we get our homes back? No, you're giving that money to the church. Made merchandise of you. Listen to verse 4. It says, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, their eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world, uh, upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example to those that, li- that live, that after should live ungodly, and deliver just Lot, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelleth among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and deserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. To be punished. So if God is not even sparing the angels that sinned, do you think he's going to deliver the ungodly? Do you think he's going to spare the ungodly and the wicked? And he gives us examples. He did not spare the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Some of them delivered uh, in chains of darkness be reserved unto judgment. He didn't spare the old world, the world before the flood, but saved Noah. He didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. All their sexual fornication and and perverseness that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't spare them, but he delivered Lot out of there. He knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. God knows how to deliver those that are walking righteously from danger. He does that in many ways. He does it through the voice of the Holy Spirit. He does it through the word of God that we can see to stay away from things. A person that is a recovering alcoholic shouldn't go anywhere near a pub. That just makes common sense. That's why God says abstain from all appearance of evil. Enter not into temptation. God gives us clear warnings to stay away from sinful things. God knows what he's doing when it comes to judgment and when it comes to deliverance. God wants to deliver people. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. He wants everyone to come to repentance. But it says in verse 10, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, and desire and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And listen to this next verse. It says, Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. So he's talking about these unjust people who are railing, who are hating governments, who are despising governments, who are, are, are speaking evil of dignities, speaking evil of the president or the king or the queen or the prime minister. That's the kind of pl- the, the world we live in just now where people are going to speak evil of these things. Even Christians. Christians are probably the worst for doing it. Slamming this president. That's, that's not my president. I didn't vote for him. It's too bad. He's still your president. It's still our prime minister, whether we voted for him or not. The Bible says that God 
raises up these things. And you say, well, God made a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. God allows things to happen. It may not be his perfect will for such and such prime minister, such and such king, or such and such president to be in. But when people turn their back on God and they require that, it wasn't God's will to have a king for Israel, but the people desired to have a king. And so you say, there you go, Saul. And then things turn sour. God's like, well, what did you expect? When Saul turned his back on God, we're thinking, what do you expect? Then you have Solomon comes along. You know, in three generations. Saul, David, then Solomon. You know, Saul started out really good. You know, just as he was going along. So did David, until he committed adultery with Bathsheba and murder Uriah. And then Solomon comes along, and he's, he's doing wonderful. I mean, he's got wisdom that's unsurpassed. But he has no common sense when it comes to the women. He marries all these women, not even checking out their background, going by lust of the flesh, not checking out from whence they came or what God they served. didn't matter to him that they served Moloch. Or they served Ashtaroth. And so to appease his wife, they said, Honey, can you build me an altar to Ashtaroth? Honey, can you build me a statue for Molech? And he does. It still amazes me every time I read it, how that a man that had wisdom of Solomon to discern between the baby and the two women, to have such great wisdom of these things, and to have compassion on these people, could build such an altar to Moloch to put children to death, to sacrifice perhaps as even his own children passing through the fire to Moloch. It amazes me how someone that had a father like David, who could be raised in the ways of the Lord, could transgress God's commandments so much. It really amazes me. But you say, was it God's will to set them up? God put them in there. God chose who it was. God raises them. God sets them down. So it is not up to us to speak evil of them. But look what it says. Even the angels do not bring really accusation against them before the Lord. So when you are speaking evil of your dignitaries, of your president, of your prime minister, or even your pastors, your deacons, your teachers, your husbands, your wives, should you be doing that? No. no. We take the example for the, the angels that don't bring a really accusation against them before the Lord. Like Michael, the archangel, when disputing over the body of Moses, does not bring against him, uh, against the devil, a railing accusation, but said, What? The Lord rebuke thee. You want to bring something down on somebody? Say, The Lord rebuke thee. Because I have nothing in me to wreak you with. Jesus said, He that is guiltless cast the first stone. People are trying to tear down this president or the last president or whatever. And I see on both sides, uh, on Facebook, some guys going on about this guy and some guys going on about this guy. And, you know, they're just a big conflict. I said, why are this really accusations? Why don't we all just look at the scriptures and see what the scripture says? If we get in the scriptures, we can say the Lord rebuke thee. And can say what he's doing is wrong according to the scriptures. But to call him an idiot, to call him whatever else names is a railing accusation. The Bible says don't do that. Be careful of your words. Be careful of what you say and to whom. But these, it says in verse 12, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Time after time, I see people on Facebook or people on the internet trying to post videos about the Bible, trying to slam the Bible, speaking evil of the things that they don't understand. They try to take a scripture and they take it out of context and they try to do, excuse me, do this and that and they don't understand it. I've heard so many people uh, speaking evil of a doctrine that they don't understand or a church that they don't understand. If you don't understand, shut up, learn about it. But they do this constantly. 
and people in lack of knowledge because they get onto Google and they watched a video, a five minute video about this doctrine or about this guy and this, and this guy, this one guy says this guy's evil. So they take everything that he says without checking out. Oh, well, I watched a video, you know, um, you know, so how do they term it? Um, um, exposed, you know, such and such exposed. And everybody's like, ooh, it's, it's exposed. And they watch this and they believe everything they says. Why? Because it's all evil speaking of. And so they love this evil speaking. They say, oh, well, 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 you know, if he's exposing them, that must be true. And I've watched some of these uh, expose type things and it's expose, you know, exposing certain preachers. And I'm thinking, you know, you that are exposing it need to be exposed because you're talking mince. This guy, what he's saying is actually the truth. Now, there are been some preachers that are, uh, have been exposed and they are, they, they're being exposed rightfully. They've been called out for what they are. And shall receive, verse 13, shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceiving while they feast with you. Some of them get so caught up in their lies that they deceive themselves. How many of you ever known a liar whose lies were so good that he himself started to believe his own lies? Now, he was convinced that this actually happened because he had told himself, told the lie so many times, he himself believed it to be true. But you come down to it, and it wasn't true. And then you try to argue with them and say, that didn't happen. So, yes, it did. And they will argue. And you could show them a video, and they will think that you've edited the video or, or done something like that. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They're believing their lies, so they get you to believe their lies. It's a sport, some to some of them. It's, it's fun. I, I, I've seen some preachers that come in and do all, this, all these things, especially a lot in the, in the, the, the tongues movement and things like that, the, the, you know, the Toronto Blessing. Some of them don't even believe in God. They come in and they get, they've get they learned how to speak in, in, in the false tongues. And it's just something they've made up themselves. They've learned certain words and they do that and they can do it on command. And, you know, and they can do that. And by expectation, hypnosis, they get the congregation to fall over and get them to start laughing. It's simple hypnosis. Yes, it's demonic as well, but it's simple hypnosis. Because if that's what you expect to happen, that's what will happen. You get six people to come up and you tap six people on the head and they fall over on command because they're, they're plants, that's what they're going to do. The seventh person, what's he going to expect? He's going to expect that when he's tapped on the head, he's going to fall over. So it's expectation. You come up, you tap on the head, and he falls over. Intra trance. Those six people are just, you're paid, paid to do that, to set up expectation. That's how, that's how, uh, how it works. You, know, you set up an expectation for what you expect to happen will happen. If you expect that when he waves his hand, you're going to fall over. When he does that, you'll go, oh, and you'll fall over. Right. Yes, there's a demonic element to it as well. Right. Right. But a lot of it's just simple hypnosis and expectation, which is open yourself up for, for uh, demonic affliction as well. Mm-hmm. It's a sport to some of these people. They're coming in and they're, they're preaching this and doing that, and, and they go back and they just count the money. It's a game. They found a niche in the market. That these people are so stupid. They will throw money at me and I'll come in. I'll give them an exciting time and they're no better off. But yet they have in verse 14 eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. God's going to take care of these people. Yes, we need to call sin what it's sin, and yes, we need to call out things that are sin. You know, Jesus has given us the the way of church doctrine where we do things decently in order. And we need to call these things out and show them. 
But there is a difference when someone is willing to repent and struggling with sin than someone that is just not willing to even acknowledge it as sin. You know, we've had a lot of people come through this church and a lot of people we've ministered to. And some people are, are struggling with sin. Some people are struggling with something. Uh, they're struggling whether it's to try and give up cigarettes or struggling with an, an addiction. Some people come in and they're just done with it and the Lord delivers them and boom, they're free. And the, you know, the devil come back upon them and they may struggle a little bit. They may come to struggle a little bit other times. You know, and then, you know, they come out and they, they get things sorted. And God has patience. God is merciful. God is long-suffering with us, thank the Lord. You know, he knows our desires. And sometimes, sometimes we fall foul. And we, 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 we are tricked by the devil. And we choose to do his bidding. And I think God is merciful in these cases. And God is always ready to forgive for a true repentant heart. Amen. But when we see that these eyes are full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, they cannot cease from sin. Why? Because they don't want to cease from Amen. sin. Amen. There's a difference when someone that's struggling with sin, wanting to get rid of something and cannot, than someone who just continually wallows in sin and they really don't care. Now that is where it's one is given over to the devil. You go through church discipline in this way and you say, hand it over. You try with some people. Some people just want to serve the Lord. They want to be free. And it's really easy to deal with these people because they want to be free. They, they just want Jesus and nothing else. But others, they just they don't want to be free. They want to hold on to that sin. They cannot cease from sin. Why? Because they do not want to. And they are the ones that beguile unstable souls. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. How does your soul become unstable when you're double-minded? When you cannot make up your mind what is true and what is false. When you have confusion, and we know that God is not the author of confusion. When that confusion comes in, you can be beguiled on an unstable soul. And we see this happening more and more. Yes, YouTube and the internet is, is really good for getting the gospel out and getting good teaching around the world, but it's only a small percentage of good teaching that's on there. Most of it is junk, nonsense, programming, Satanism, bringing people in like that. And when someone is unstable, when someone is unstable, they're easily beguiled because there'll come a doctrine that is, is more suitable to their to their fleshly wants. And they will accept that because, why? Because the true biblical doctrine is a bit hard. Well, bless your heart. Sometimes Jesus said things that was a hard saying. In John chapter 6, we, they said, this is a hard saying. And many of them, John 6, chapter 60, John 6, verse 66, many turned back. Jesus looked at the disciples and said, will you go also? And she says, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. And we are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mm -hmm. You know? He was not unstable at that point. He knew who he was. Why? Because flesh and blood had not revealed it to him. But he knew. Who could, they knew one thing, that Jesus was who he said he was. He might have been unstable there when he denied Christ. There might have been some, some other, other unstableness throughout his life. But on that thing, he knew and was sure that Jesus was indeed Christ. At heart, they have exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam. Going after that. And of course, we know the story of Balaam. But his donkey turned around, <laughs> why are you hitting me? He said, you won't move. <laughs> and then he sees the angel, he's like, oh, my bad. Sometimes it takes something like that to stop us in our tracks because we're trying to push on and try and push on. And God's trying to stop us doing something and we're determined 
to go on, but there's that angel just ready to, you know. God says, hang on. Give them a chance. Give them a chance. Verse 17 says, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. The end of these false teachers. For when they spake great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. You know, if we keep ourselves clean, if we keep ourselves in the word, we won't be deceived. We won't be deceived by these false prophets. Just because they've got a giant stage, just because they've got a multi-million dollar building, they have their own TV channel, does not mean that they're truth. You might say, well, they've got a little bit of meat. We just eat the meat, spit out the bones. That don't work either. Because when they're mixing meat with rat poison, sometimes you can't tell the difference. And you only need that little bit of poison. You just need that one swear word that gets in and it builds up. And what? You start believing pretty much everything that they say. Because why? You're too lazy to go check it out. Best thing, don't even entertain these ones. You know, and I told you about the, the fellow that was here that, that um, you know, him and his wife just had this big deal for Joel Osteen. And because of that, he couldn't get saved. He was ready to get saved, coming down to this altar. He was ready to pray and accept Jesus Christ as Savior, to, to, to repent of his sins. And then something kicked off. He said, oh, no, but my sins are paid for, past, present, and future. I don't need to do this. I said, who told you that? He said, he said my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. I said, who told you that? He said, Joel Osteen did. I said, well, I'm sorry, but Joel Osteen is wrong because that's not what the Bible says. I said, your sin is paid for. But it's not forgiven. You must ask for forgiveness. He said, no, 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 no. Joel Osteen says. And he said, well, this is what the Bible says. Oh, but Joel Osteen has got this massive church and he's got his own television. I'm sure, I'm sure he wouldn't be telling us things that were wrong. He's going to tell you whatever you want to hear so his next paycheck come, come in. Anytime somebody would charge $800 to sit in the front row of the church. Yes, you heard me right. He charges 800 and some dollars for, for a person to sit in the front row for his morning services. You got $800? Yeah, three times a week, $800. That's some seriousness. You pay $800 and you fall asleep. That's an expensive nap right there. Let's see what well, he's going to tell you, whatever you want to hear. Because it feels good, it tickles the ears. Or wells without water, the Bible says. They speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. Promising a lady, oh, you can be free. If you'll just send this amount of money in, we'll pray for you, we'll send you a hanky. You know, I'll blow my nose and I'll send it out to you. If you pay money for that. Holy snot. You watch it be next. A preacher come out and sniffing pe pepper and sneezing on the congregation. Here's so holy snot. <laughs> They're promising you liberty, but all the while bringing you more and more into bondage. That you can't escape from them. The more that you watch them. The more it's bringing you under bondage. 
till you get away from the Bible completely and just listen to what they say. And then the time comes where you can't even understand the Bible. You start to read it and you're like, I can't understand this. I'm not getting anything from this. So what do you do? You go and turn them on again and they explain to you what it's saying. Well, that's a bad place to be in if you can't open your Bible and say, God, teach me. I'm not saying we don't need preachers. We don't need churches. Sometimes we, we need to learn from, from men of God that have gone before us. Because they can teach us these things, just as they did in the Old Testament. Amen. To teach the fathers, to teach the children. Sure. But we also need to be able to open the Word of God and say, Lord, you teach me. Amen. If we cannot, there is problems. And you can be brought into bondage by these things. Verse 20 says, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy command, commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to, turned to its own vomit again. The sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. This is a dangerous thing. To know the truth. To know righteousness. For God to have taught you to walk in righteousness. Then to turn again from that. To backslide. Into the things of the world. It's going to be worse. For that person. Than if they had never known what true righteousness was. The way of righteousness. You say, are they lost? No, and not talk about being lost. Talk about the way of righteous, the way of right living. It'd be better for a person not to know how to live righteously and stand before the Lord in their ignorance than to have known what they should have been doing and turn again from it. And we see you see that so much today. You see the problems that oh, we're we're doing okay, we're doing grand, but their mind is gone. They're, they're accepting this and that and everything. Why? Because they once knew righteousness but have turned from it. Amen. These preachers on the God channel probably have never really known the way of righteousness. It's not that they've turned back to it, but they are causing so many to turn away from righteousness. And that's why God's call is to repentance and to righteousness, to holiness. He said, well, that won't happen. The Bible says it will. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. They thought they were bad when they were, far, they were lost and they just got saved. See what happens to them once they've known what righteousness is, known what it is to walk in righteousness, and they've chosen to turn their back on God. It's worse. But thankfully, God in his mercy says, hey, you can always come back to me. Just turn around. Just repent. You can walk in righteousness once more, God says. Amen. God doesn't leave us hung out to dry. He says, turn. I'm giving you that opportunity. I'm giving you this season to repent. I'm giving you this teshuva. The season to repent. But it says the dog has returned his own vomit into the sow that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. That doesn't need to happen. Why does that happen? Because it's in the nature of a dog to go back to his vomit. It's in the nature of a sow to go back and wallow in the mire. It's their nature. That's what they do. But when we are saved, we are given the ability to partake in the divine nature. Our nature should change so that we're no longer of the old nature. Yes, it's natural for someone to go back and do the things they were doing. But when their nature changes... When we're armed with the mind of Christ, there's no need for that anymore. Amen. If you could change a dog's nature, he wouldn't go back to his vomit. If you could change a pig's nature, she would be washed and she would say, hey, look at me, I'm washed, I'm all clean. Hey, praise the Lord. She wouldn't go back to the mire. But it's in our nature to get mucky. When we're saved, it's no longer in our nature to wallow in sin, to wallow in the mire, or to go back to our vomit. It's no longer there. It shouldn't be there. What is wrong? 
alone. What are Christians today? What is wrong that they choose not to partake in the divine nature? But they choose to keep their old nature. To keep in the old man going. When God says, put to death the old man. Put him away. Put him away. Put off the old man and put on Jesus Christ. Put on the new nature. Put on the divine nature. Arm yourself with the mind of Christ. God gives us all the tools. There's no need for us to go back and walk in the mire. But be careful of who you listen to. Who you read. What you do. Because it only takes one thing to start bringing you back into it. It only takes one word, one glimpse, one picture, one video, one film to get you hooked. And then it gets more and more and more and it spirals and then it's out of control. And then you're like, I can't do it. I can't turn from this sin. I can't stop it now. But we can when we turn to God. Don't be that dog. Don't be that son. Don't turn back. Don't turn back. If you have turned back, turn again to the Lord. Turn again to Him. Please. Turn back to the Lord. If you made a mistake in following false prophet, suck it up. We made a mistake. I listened to something that I shouldn't have listened to. I read something I shouldn't have listened to. I shouldn't have read. And I got convinced of something because I didn't check out in the scriptures. Hey, we've all done that. Suck it up. Stop being so prideful. Say, God is word is only truth. And turn again and be washed and never wallow in that mire again. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we thank you for your goodness. God, I pray that we'd always walk in truth, always walk in righteousness, and that everything we do that is before your eyes is pleasing to your sight. Lord, let nothing that we do grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all that we do be pleasing to you, Lord. Let it always be for your honor and glory, and lead us and direct us in all truth. God, we give you praise and we give you thanks, and we pray for each one that's here and each one that's watching. All might be challenged in our hearts to do more for you this week. We thank you, Lord, and we love you, and we pray that you be with us and bless us now. In Jesus' most precious name, for his sake. Amen. 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 Well, we didn't have to worry about breaking it up, did we? <laughs>